Ah, one thing that I can't change is uh, the slipping of the years. Uh, I, I don't, uh, don't fear getting older, don't feel getting older, but sometimes it says, wake up, boy. You're older. <laughs> it's been an interesting journey. Uh, what I'm going to share with you today is uh, it may sound a little tough at times, but I want to tell you that I am going through these kinds of things in my own life at this very moment. And it's the idea of gratitude and thankfulness. And I found myself, I don't know, I have a habit of wanting to pray before I eat. I know you can pray and give thanks for after you've eaten, but there's something about praying before, because if it isn't something you like, you're not going to change your prayer. You know, you're just going to pray. And, uh, and I found myself sitting down to something, and next thing I know, I'm eating, and I haven't even take time, taken time to give thanks. And it really bothers me, because I'm confessing this love for Jesus, and I want to do things that honor you, Lord. I want you to be the center of everything I am, and, and all that I do, I want you to be the, the center of it all. But I sit down to eat. He isn't even there. I haven't even acknowledged him. And I wondered how much of our lives are in that frame of mind. And in so doing, we miss the very essence of what he wants to teach us, show us, or portray to us in the way of the depth of things being different. And by that, I mean we've, uh, I, you've, most of you have heard my story, so it's, I'm going to repeat myself maybe, but that's okay. It's part of the program today. Uh, I remembered, uh, like, it was really tough to get the idea that Jesus was the center of everything. And it took quite some drastic measures for him to get my attention in the first place. And uh, I mentioned about my daughter uh, running away at 14 years old. She was my daughter to a previous marriage. So there was the indications of something was radically wrong. Something had been broken, and we didn't know how to fix it. It was out of my control. I don't like it when I can't control things. Uh, there are things that I absolutely know I can't, but if physically I thought I could do anything and everything, afraid of nothing and afraid of nobody. Not very smart. Not very smart. So when Helen ran away between Christmas and New Year's of 1976-77, I found myself really in a very desperate place. I kind of wanted to believe in God. I always did, but there was never any kind of reverence in my life that would give indication to that. And Sandra had come down five months prior to that with rheumatoid arthritis, and she was desperately in desperate shape. There was nothing the doctors could do for her. Sent her home to take aspirins, 18 of them a day. It would have killed her. She'd have never made it. So I'm in this hard place, and there's this invitation to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And both Sandra and I did that, and there's a much more to the story of how difficult it would have been had Sandra accepted Christ and I had not because I would have not been her buddy. I would have been definitely set against her. But isn't it interesting? Both at the same time. Same time. So now I'm looking at a lot of things in my life's journey, and I have much, much reason to be grateful. So much reason to be grateful. So much reason to be thankful. But how many times do I really take opportunity to express it? How many times is there the question that raises up, is your God really real? Is your God really capable of doing all that you think and say he can do? Is he really real at all? Isn't he maybe one of those people like Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny? He's just a figure that we speak about. He's not really relevant or real. Oh, hello. I want to tell you, he is relevant and he is real. I have never stood before him face to face, but I have been in his presence. And as even I share it, I can feel what it was like in those moments of 
just being able to feel his presence before you. It was not long moments. It wasn't an hour. It wasn't days. It wasn't anything like that. It was moments when he came. And when he came, you didn't want him ever to leave. You wanted him to stay. Because that's what his presence is like. Now, I want to tell you that I believe his presence is in this place today. Not because I'm here, but because you're here, and I'm here with you, and he's with us. So I have no idea what manifestations may want to take place today, because he is present, and he is real, and he's greatly concerned about each and every one of you. I was driven to uh, things, so many things taking place. I got so many things up here. I, I should get rid of some of them. But, you know, when you get affirmations to something, you're on to something. And uh, this little fish wrapper thing, very popular. There, you find them in some places, they just give them away. And right in the front page, it's thankful. The next page is gratitude. Thankfulness, gratitude. Then I get this Epoch Times, I think I'm saying it right. And in here is one big page that says, whoops, it's right here. The power and healing of gratitude. And I thought, how fitting. So this has been on my mind for a couple of weeks now. Actually, I knew three, four weeks ago, maybe I was asked to preach, at least that long ago. And I thought, well, I got all this time to prepare. You'd be upset if you saw all the notes I was going to bring. I have days and days of just writing and writing and things that I felt needed to be included because I want to make sure, I want to make sure that I don't put Jesus on the back burner, claim a love for him, but ignore him. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be one of those. And yet, I sit down to eat. What happened? What happened? Did all of a sudden feeding my face or my mouth become more significant than giving thanks to him first? Really? Really. Now, I know this isn't about age. It's not about age. It's about relationship and the significance of a relationship. Uh, my wife would probably be the one who would suffer the most of sometimes not feeling appreciated. And uh, I don't even know if she remembers it. The other day I went home and I just wanted to love her. I just wanted to tell her I was thankful for her. I wanted to tell her that she's been special. She worries about her appearance. I have a picture over there carrying my wallet and that's what I see. What I saw years and years ago, I still see today. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful that the Lord takes times to say, where is your focus and where is your attention and where is the strength of your ministry and whatever all you're going to do? Where is that strength? Well, it's in our relationships. Well, I thought, well, maybe I ought to take a journey. Go into uh, Jeremiah 18 and take a trip down to the, the potter's house. And uh, I have a, <laughs> would you know it, I happen to have a song, something about that, don't I? What do I do with it? Oh, it's right here. Uh, it's called, uh, He Didn't Throw the Clay Away. Now, there's a story about this. I'll give the story after I sing the song. I was debating when to, when to sing this song. I said, get it out of the way. Don't keep people, you know, whatever. It's called, He Didn't Throw the Clay Away.
nowhere uh, to go. In fact, I had the idea that my sins had been so great that God would never have anything to do with me ever again. Not true. I didn't realize that at that moment, when I made that commitment, God took me serious. And so I began to get into the process of being reconstructed by the potter, having no idea that that was taking place. But let's journey in this book of Jeremiah, chapter 18. I'll read the first 12 verses. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, working at his wheel. And the vessel he was making of that day was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he re reworked it into another vessel, so it seemed good to the potter to do. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do this with you, as this potter has done? Declares the Lord, Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. It is, it is if at any time I declare... Look, my print is small in this book, <laughs> and I don't need glasses, but... <clears throat> that I will, uh, you are... You are in my hand, O house of Israel, if that any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. And if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from evil, I will relent of the disaster that I would intend to do to it. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it, and if it does, not, it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I have intended to do to it. Now therefore, say to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am sharpening disaster against you and devising a plan against you. Return every one of you his e from his evil way, that your ways and your deeds, but they say, that is in vain. We will follow our own plans and will everyone act according to his stubbornness of his evil heart. And I'm thinking of the days we're in, and more and more, it's like we find it very distasteful to declare our allegiance for the Lord. It depends where you are. It can be problematic, since some people are saying that you people that are Christians are terrorist organizations, and we despise and don't trust, and we need to eliminate you. In our world, that's the agenda. They want a, another form of something to worship, but not our God. They believe they have a better way. We need to be sure of who he is, and many Christians are not sure of who he is. We declare him, but we really don't know who he is, more than what he wants to do, in and through our lives. We seem to be more uh, leaning toward the intellectual or an emotional experience, but not a really genuine one that gets where your heart really gets, God gets hold of your heart. Matthew 16, 13, who do people say the Son of Man is? Jesus is asking this to his disciples. And then in verse 15, they answer him, but then he says, but what about you? Who do you say I am? I, I know we've talked about this before, this uh, uh, organization that takes censuses, uh, what, I forget what they call them. Can't think of their name at the moment. But, uh, pardon? Barna, yes, Barna. They took a census and they had this uh, nation, over the nation, and found that 69% of the people were Christians, called themselves Christians. But the disgusting part was only 9% knew what it meant. And it stirred me because I thought, are you one of the nine or are you one of the nine, 69? Because you can get into this position of being so familiar that you become comfortable and you forget 
that there's obediences and things to do and be established, and they're not about you. They're really about what the kingdom of God wants to do in this day and in this age. And this confession of being molded and made in the potter's hand. I love the idea that before God ever knew, well, I shouldn't say it that way. He always knew of us. He always knew of us. And there was a time when, before I was even deposited in my mother's womb, he knew he knew about me. He knew what I was going to experience in my life. He knew the disappointments. He knew the self-destructive things that I would do. And in spite of all that he knew, he loved me anyway. Amen. And loved me enough to allow the time for my heart's door to be opened and receive him. And from that point on, Life has never been the same, praise God. John 6, 26. I tell you the truth, you are looking for me, not because you see miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and fishes and had your full. There's a lot of people who want a relationship with the Lord because there's a benefit mentioned about being in that relationship. There are things that he offers that is not anywhere available like that to us. And so we want those things. But it's almost as if we got this frame of mind, Lord, you really got a good catch when you got me in the kingdom. Oh, how beneficial I am to you. And how wonderful people must be that you gathered me up and rescued me out of the darkness and put light in my life and words in my mouth that I could proclaim your name. And it's almost, you want to invite a moment of silence. Yeah, like that. You want to invite a moment of silence? You'll get it. Because he, sits, he just patiently waits until you get to the place of saying, oh, it's really not about me, is it, Lord? I couldn't even have done any of those things without your aid. There is no way I could have even thought of it apart from you. So, Lord, I am so very grateful that you took my stinking attitude and changed it to gratitude and gratefulness. Thank you so much, Lord, for loving me enough to do that. But today, it's like uh, people don't want to acknowledge that. I don't know where they think we came from. We just must have crawled out of the water someplace and developed into what we are uh, because they don't want to acknowledge the uh, idea of God being the developer, builder, and controller of uh, not only us, but the whole earth, the whole world. Luke 6.46 why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? Jesus frequently rebuked his disciples for their lack of faith. Their unbelief revealed that they really had not come to know who he was. Thus, they did not know what he could do. It's a name, like any other name. You know, we're really popular. We have a it's really popular to have these Nike things or whatever, a name of something, shoes, shirts, sweaters, coats, hats, everything's got a name on it. Whatever happened to just plain old clothes? Amen. And uh, they're getting more expensive, more expensive all the time, and I think we ought to get some rebates for the advertising rights or something. <laughs> but anyway, it's like it's, everything's got this attachment to it, and it's like we have an attachment. I can't tell you where my mark is. I mean, it's probably in here someplace where when the Lord baptized me with his Holy Spirit and put his mark of ownership on me, oh, I'm so grateful. I can't see it, but I know it's there. And I don't have to show it to anybody. Actually, it's shown by my attitudes, my gratitudes, the things I do, the way I speak, the way I act. Those are the things that kind of give indication that this potter just didn't do a remake. He did a total reconstruction. Total reconstruction. So we go down and we, I go to this potter's house and I said, Lord, I just want to watch what you do. Well, that's wonderful, but huh, he makes us in secret. He makes us in secret places 
where no one goes that I'm aware of. No one sees except probably the Holy Spirit, probably God the Father, probably Jesus, but nobody gets to view how you're being made. And in that process, there is moments when there's a little glitch. I'm not a potter. I've never done it, but I know that it's really, it's, they are really sensitive. Your fingers, I mean, why don't they wear gloves and something instead of using your hands? It, got, it really gets rough making this piece of clay. And then it's not right. It's not right. And he takes it and makes it again until it's what he wanted. Every one of us were released from the potter's house when it was time to send us. And he did not make inferior product. He did not. But much of the world now wants to rise up and tell us that this being a Christian and believing in God's word and all that kind of stuff is, is foolishness. I think we've got to go back to the potter's house where it began, where he really did the work in us. And remember what it was like. I remember almost everything that took place in the transformation of my very life. I was almost 40 years old when that happened. And I thought, there's no way this is the way life is. We're made to be like this. That's the way it is. We just persevere. Life is kind of junky, but it's life. What do you do about it? And all of a sudden, this transformational process took place. I certainly don't have time to testify of all the events, but I want to tell you something that was very important to me. There were a couple of occasions, maybe more than that, but at least a couple where I began to hear the voice of the Lord. I began to hear him speak to me. I also witnessed the voice of the enemy. Too many times we don't take time to listen to the voice that's speaking to us, what it says, how it says it. We don't know. So we lack some of these experiences, which gives us the idea that oh, God doesn't really matter about me. I've never had anything happen to me like, like happened to that guy. And I remember somebody coming to me one time and said, oh, I wish I had a testimony like yours. I said, no, you don't. No, you don't. I would never want you to have a testimony, a testimony like mine. Your testimony needs to be that God has faithfully kept you from the stuff that I went through. God has faithfully kept you from all that stuff. Anyway, he comes, he comes to the potter's house. He doesn't say, Good, why don't you venture down to the potter's house? He says, go to the potter's house. In other words, go back to the creator. Go back to what struck you and brought new life to you. Whatever did it bring to you that brought awareness of life being different, fuller, and totally different than what you even thought. And it was at the potter's house. It started there. And God wants to reveal to us that he's still in the business of making people like you and me. Why does he do that? One of the reasons is he wants people to love. He wants people to love. And he wants the people, hopefully, to love him back. He gives us a free will, so we don't have to. However, we need to give some thought to, who do I pay homage to? Who do I honor? How gr grateful am I? Really, is it something that is engrafted into me, actually becomes so much a part of me, I don't know how to separate myself from it, nor do I want to? And in the days that are coming, the days that are ahead of us, oh my, oh my, we need... We need a close and meaningful relationship. There was a quote that I wrote. Your, if your love relationship with God is not as it should be, nothing else will be in order. Nothing else will be in order. Uh, I don't want to sound like a bad guy, but boy, there are some times when uh, things take hold of me and I don't quite understand what's happening, but I can get really upset sometimes. Uh, I, I don't have a desire to get physical, like fighting or anything, not quite. <laughs> but it's, uh, there's just changes that come that uh, make you aware that they do not, uh, that those things, those attitudes don't help you. 
They do nothing to, for you. So if your love relationship was not where it needs to be, and you work on that, but get to know one thing also, that God is not your servant to bless your plans and desires. But rather, he's a God that desires for us to serve him and love him. This is God. I mean, that's what he wants. And that's what he likes. And so he tells them to go down to the potter's house, and my words will speak to you in essence down there. I want you to listen. Listen. I don't know about you, but boy, do I get in this place of where uh, I, Sandra used to suffer from this, maybe still. She'd have a problem. I have the answer. I haven't even heard the problem fully yet. I've got the answer even before she tells me what the problem is. And uh, God's saying, you know, there's times when you need to be silent. If you want to have a conversation with me or come to meet with me, spend most of the time with your mouth shut and your ears open. Really, you really take time to hear what it is I want to say to you. He was working with special clay, important vessels made from imperfection to perfect. That's what he did for us. Isaiah 64, 8 says, Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Jeremiah 1, 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I ap appointed you as a prophet before the nations. So even before we were born, my question is, who is he? Who is he to you? And what has he designed you to become? There's so many individuals not getting their, reaching their destiny or even being aware that they have one. They get all wrapped up in the world and all the things that are taking place and we lose our focus. So the question, I give people this one book about purpose-driven life. I read that book several times. And whether you like Rick Warren or whether you don't, it doesn't matter. What he had to say was rather significant. We need to get to the place of where we know what God's purpose is in my life. Now, I'm getting up there. <laughs> and uh, I, I was in a meeting uh, a week ago with some leaders down in Virginia and Williamsburg. And uh, we've known one another kind of quite a number of years, actually. And, and actually, Bob Atkins, the pastor who, who is now deceased, uh, we, want, we knew one another since 1990, I believe it was. And so there was a lot of stuff take place in our relationships. It was, we'd go there pretty often, and uh, these guys wanted to know. They just wanted to know something. So they gathered a meeting, and we met. And uh, there was something really significant that I wanted to share at the church that Sunday. But he had, they had a guest speaker, and he was really a good speaker, really good. And so I didn't feel like interrupting, or you don't need to do stuff. You need kind of don't need to, sometimes you don't need to do what you think you need to do. In this meeting, uh, they said, uh, our church is, is growing. I said, yes, it's quite noticeable. I said, but more important than its growth is what I felt there in the way of spiritual uh, sensitivity. I said, it really felt very good. Growth has not caused your uh, relationship or purposes for the Lord to diminish. In fact, it's grown. I felt really like, wow. I want to say, I can say wow. And you can say it backwards too, wow. And, it, you know, it's double impact, but it's like uh, that meant a lot to them. And then they wanted to know what I was thinking about Williamsburg and would I be interested in something. And one guy said, you think about moving here? I said, years ago, yeah, but we like to come, but we'd rather go home, you know, just go home. And he said, I'm a realtor. I can get you a house in a minute. And I said, no, this is, not, this is not my purpose. This is not where I belong. 
But when I got home, I thought about those, that meeting and I thought, my purpose is not this prophetic thing, not this guy that comes in and blasts the whole thing apart or whatever. It's, it's to give them the comfort of knowing that the will of God is being met there. It's to encourage them that they're doing what, whatever they're doing, it's the right thing with the right purpose. And I felt useful. Isn't that strange? I didn't preach. I didn't sing. Just made aware. And so I began to think the latter part of my life is about those kind of things. There's so many people hurting, so many people who do not have this significant relationship with the Lord. And I'm thinking, this is not right. We have to get into this because the days that are ahead of us are really nasty. I don't know about many of you are following Jonathan Kahn. I just, I finished this book, The Return of the Gods. If you get a chance, you ought to read it. Now that does not mean that you neglect this book for this book, but this book lets you know what's taking place. All of a sudden, the ugly stuff that's happening is beginning to appear. Jesus needs to be center stage. Thanksgiving comes and then we come into Christmas. And I'm at the place of where I left all, most of my notes at home. Because the one thing that was important to me is that we absolutely must revere our Christ. We must love him. We must honor him. We must obey him. We must recognize him. And I thought of, I'll be careful now because I'm getting through all kinds, uh, Christmas is coming. It's on a Sunday. Who do you think is going to take precedence? What do you think is going to take precedence on that day? Can you imagine being invited to a birthday party for yourself and being totally ignored because too many other things are getting in the way? Hmm, I wonder. I wonder. God really uh, has things under control whether we think so or not. I, I have so many encounters and I don't have time to tell you all those, but I would say that this, if, <laughs> if God moves into a service, like I want to tell you to put your watches away, stuff like that today. Because we keep limiting the Spirit of God to moments if we get an hour or more, oh, do we get uneasy. He's really cutting into my time now. Besides, doesn't he know there's a football game on I want to see at 1 o'clock? Doesn't he know I want to get to the restaurant at 12 before it gets packed? Doesn't he know that I have all these other things that I need to do? Yeah, I do love you, Lord, but there are these things. You know, I've got I to gotta be attentive to them. Really? What if... When your darkest moments came, Jesus would say, gee, I really appreciate your calling. But one of my disciples came by and we're having tea. And we'd just like to take this time and not be bothered because we're always getting interrupted and there's really not a major thing that you're dealing with. We can talk about it another time, can't we? Isn't that the way we treat Jesus so much of the time? Now, I'm, I'm talking to you but really, I'm talking to me. I'm asking myself the very same questions. I'm working through many of the same things that I thought they were all taken care of. But no, they weren't all taken care of. Why weren't they all taken care of? Because at the moment, I wasn't able to understand how to deal with the depth of things. But all of a sudden, it was like, Lord, didn't we do this before? Yes. Yes. As much as you could comprehend. Even though you were willing to go and do whatever it was, it was too much. But now I want to take you through everything because the days that are coming, you need to be prepared. 
And those can be obstacles that get in the way even though you never thought that they were anything at all. And all of a sudden they raise their ugly head and you got a problem and you wonder, where did that come from? I wonder. There are new and deeper things he wants to, you to understand so that they can s set you free. There is more of God's nature, his purpose, and ways that he still wants to reveal to us. More. Can you imagine? John 8, 32 says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Well, today there's no truth, absolute, no absolute truth. That's what they want to say. And they can do anything, get away with anything, because nothing's true. It's just how you feel about it, what you want, what you desire. And it's a shame. God is still the way, the only one. And there's a lot of conversations now about we can find other ways to heaven. Jesus isn't important anymore. There has to be a way that we can get there. Intellectually, we'll make that transition, and we'll get there. We don't need Jesus. We don't need God. We don't need anything about that. We have no need of it at all. But there's a coming calamity. I almost feel like uh, I've never witnessed a tsunami. Any guy, anybody ever witnessed a tsunami and survived? I haven't, but they're horrible, apparently. And uh, I almost feel like there's a spiritual sense of a tsunami coming, something that is ready to break loose, and it's like, when will this be? When will this be? And that was like the last, I forget when I spoke here last, so I probably saw the same things all over again. I thought, Lord, I want to, uh, I want to know what's going to happen with this next election. So I, I, I read a book of Esther, all that stuff. It, nothing happened like I thought it was going to happen because I was, it was being revealed to me that God was up to something and I thought it was going to happen around election time. It went past election. And then I thought, uh-oh, did I misinterpret it? Was it my understanding wrong? And it was like, no, it's about timing. Evil has not yet reached the peak of its timing. And I wanted to say, well, Lord, why don't you just come and destroy us now? And he said, wait a minute, there's a lot of souls that need to get saved. If I brought destruction now, there'd be horrible loss, horrible loss. And they are people of my creation. They came from my potter's hand. I made them. And if in any way possible, if there be any way possible, I want to rescue them. I want to bring them into that place where they can fellowship with me in that place of promise, that place of eternity, where all the stuff that we're dealing with this day will not be there to interrupt anything. Grateful, gratitude, thankful. The enemy is uh, filled with uh, identity theft, deception, lies, doubt, fear, uh, uh, distributes our social settings. The pan this pandemic thing was more than just an illness of some kind. Not that there weren't people who got sick, not that there weren't people who got died, but it was orchestrated for a purpose. The first place they went was to close down the church. And I was irate. And I almost asked Pastor Joel, I said, Joel, can I crawl into the church unnoticed? Because I want to go where the house of the Lord is. Not that he isn't where I am, but there's something about going to the refuge where the place is called the house of the Lord. Something about that. And we've forgotten. Do you remember? Not that long ago. We were not supposed to say Merry Christmas. We were to say Happy Holidays or something like that. Do you remember that they wanted to take away all the little scenes of Christmas in villages? And we had a movie about it here someplace. Do you not think that that was a test and it will be back? It'll be back. What do we do then? Because we're not paying attention to it right now. Too many. It's too, we've had good lives. 
and it's too good for anyone to interrupt. Hello? Really? Really? I'm one of those guys that uh, when things get tough, I begin to look around and see what's taking place. You know, this, this church was numerous times people thought we should close down. And I never got a word. I never got a word from the Lord, it's time to close your doors, ever. It wasn't even suggested, but it was stand. Stand and stay and continue to believe of God's greatness. I don't know what will, I don't know how long I'm going to live. I don't have an idea of that, but I do know this. I do believe that my eyes will see the remnant of the return of the glory of the Lord. I just believe that. And I also believe that uh, the church is in good hands. I'm so grateful for Joel and Carrie. His messages are fantastic. I'm just here, you know, it's like, but uh, it's uh, the feeding as well. There's good food and good fellowship and things are beginning to take a, a different turn. I don't know what all that takes. I don't know what all that may mean, except God's still in control and he's still the potter and he's still taking those imperfect vessels and completing the work he promised that he began in them and will not ever, ever give up. He won't give up. So if you're watching for the first time today, we're going to be taking communion. And uh, I remember my first communion, we used to do it on a regular basis. You knew each month that was going to be communion Sunday. And then somebody messed it up, started having it at different times and different Sundays. And some, a couple times we had it every Sunday. It was available every Sunday, you know, communion but it began to mean, some, mean something different. I wasn't going through a ritual. I was going through an exercise of thankfulness to my Heavenly Father. And today, when we have the communion, which could you guys get ready? Uh, I don't want to just take communion. I want to be in communion, if that makes sense to you. I want to be in communion with the one who matters the most. And when I take this opportunity to make him front and foremost, I hope that he is pleased with the attitude by which it comes. And all of us, and these little guys, uh, I think they had some, I don't know if the ones in the back took it, they have some special things for you guys. Don't want the kids to miss it either. So, There's a, uh, I, should, I had another song, I should have brought it. I did bring it, but it's in the car. We don't want to do that anyway. It's uh, all my, I, I, I wanted to tell you about the song that I did sing. It was one of those moments when I had an encounter with an amazing God. We had come off of three, three months of a sabbatical and we were in Williamsburg, Virginia. And they had a little Christian bookstore there and they sold the CDs, the singing accompaniment CDs. And uh, I always liked to sing, but uh, never really pushed it that much. And uh, we're coming back from the sabbatical, and I had an encounter with the enemy. But that day, I had gone to the, the record place and, and bought this song. This, he didn't throw the of clay away. And uh, it was in the middle of the night. I got up, and I went out, and I started singing this song. Of course, I have this portable CD. Sandy doesn't hear any music. She just hears me singing. But all of a sudden, she heard me wailing. And she came out and said, should I call the ambulance? Could I, <laughs> should I call the ambulance? I said, no, 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 you don't understand. It was, uh, I sang the song a couple of times. It's funny how you can hear something and not hear it. 
And the phrase, a, a vessel of honor I am today, at the very end of singing this song through twice completely, at the very end, a, a vessel of honor I am today, because he didn't throw the clay. I lost it. I lost it. I mean, I didn't lose it. Maybe I found it. But the important thing was the enemy was telling me that I was no longer capable of pastoring the church. I should not return to the ministry. There was just a whole bunch of stuff came downloading on me. And then, and then came the awareness of what I am today because of him, not because of what I did, but what he's done and continues to do. And so music has always been very special to me. And in that moment, he said, please sing love songs to your people. So I've been wanting to sing ever since, whether you're good or not. And it really isn't about being good. It's about being obedient. And I always worry about the words that I sing because sometimes people get emotionally affected by the words. And I, I want to know what's happening for them. I don't want the songs no longer important. They are. But really, he's paying attention through whatever we do in order to bring something meaningful to people. So that's my God. And I, I, time for the communion. The first time I took communion, it was like really, really special. In fact, one of the first times I took communion, it was, took it three times in one evening. We had an evening service. And there was a guy who was crippled really bad in an automobile accident, and he's going to go up for communion, and he's going to be by himself. And I felt the Lord just touch me and say, go have communion. Join him for communion. So I did that. Next thing, you know, somebody else goes up, and the Lord says, go have communion with him. And I thought, Lord, I already did it. No, I said, go have communion with him. So I did it. And then the next time, I think it was with, finally with Sandy and whoever else, Three times. So it's not a matter of, do I? <laughs> yes, I do. Thank you. But it was different because it was, I wasn't, I wasn't doing something for a form. I was doing something for my Savior. He was my personal Savior. And am I going to treat him like everything else is just the same? No. So, Lord, I want to thank you for your uniqueness. I thank you that in that role of the potter, you took from me all those things that were obstacles in my journey, all those things that tried to rob and create your place in my life. And I thank you, Lord God, that when you went to the cross and you took all those beatings and bore all that shame, you did it so that me and others like me might come into that place of knowing full well that as you hung on that cross and looked across the distance of time, we were on your mind even then. So Lord, we take this emblem that represents your body and take it graciously and gratefully for your thoughtfulness on behalf of us all. Take and eat. Lord, I want to thank you for the blood that still has the power to cleanse the unrighteous, the sick, whatever, Lord, it cleanses. It still has the power that it had then, and it does the same now. And as we have opportunity, Lord, to drink of it, let us think of some kind of healing presence that we take into our bodies to dispel all the things that the enemy has tried to plant there and to keep us from reaching that place that you have designed us to go, that your blood still cleanses and sets us free. And we thankfully drink of it in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, now, Lord, we again say thank you for your thoughtfulness. 
Thank you that we weren't just something across the distance of time. You're ever present with us, desiring, Lord, to see and bring us into that place that you've equipped us to become and give us the strength and courage and the ability to discern the things that are essential in making your kingdom a better place. And Lord, I thank you that it isn't that you said what you designed initially wasn't good enough, but it gets better because you try to shape us now into your likeness, into your images, for our good purpose is set in you. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.